Welcome everyone to this um, our adoption series uh, webinar and discussion. Um, as is probably always the case in these, um, people will be uh, arriving. Uh, some of you will be here now. Uh, people will probably be arriving over the next couple of minutes um, or so. Uh, and so we'll just have a sort of slow start and uh, an introduction. We'll get going with the main presentation from uh, Gabe in about four or five uh, minutes time. Um, in the meantime, what I'm going to do is just run through a few uh, few introductory slides and sort of set up the um, the plan for the the session. Okay, hopefully everyone can see uh, see my slides now. Um, so first of all, this is an our consortium led um, webinar um, with uh, a focus on the R adoption series for the the pharmaceutical um, industry, but the R consortium um, has a much broader uh, mission and vision um, beyond uh, beyond the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so, if you are interested um, in um, learning a little bit, little bit more about the R Consortium, you can go to the R Consortium website. Uh, I imagine most of you found this webinar through the website, so you're possibly familiar with it. But please do check out um, some of the working groups and so on that are uh, within the R Consortium. Um, ones like the RTRS work working group, which Gabe is representing. Uh, today, our validation hub, which is something that I represent, there's several others on there uh, as well that are uh, relevant to this industry uh, and, and beyond the industry, as I said. This, um, this particular um, webinar and webinar series, for those who had, uh, may be joining for the first time, is aimed at um, people who are leading our adoption initiatives. So this might be um, heads of programming, data science, statistics. It might be um, people who are, are enthusiastic, enthusiasts who are trying to um, promote R within their organizations. Um, but it's very much pitched at people who are trying to drive um, drive change in their organization and roll out R where perhaps it's not um, it's not the go-to language uh, today. So uh, if you haven't attended any of the other um, presentations of the series, they are all available. You can go to the R. Our consortium website go to webinars um, and you can find links to previous videos and so on in this session um, but the idea is that we're going to focus on the how to not why r uh, we won't talk too much in these kinds of presentations and, and discussions about why we should be using r um, the assumption is that you're already at that stage and you want to uh, understand maybe um, if, we, if we think of previous uh, webinars we've talked about things like training we've talked about validation and other topics relating to r um, that are potentially barriers to uh, adoption so that's the focus. Um, we always have a uh, key presentation that will kick off and I'll introduce Gabe who will be running today's presentation. And then this is normally followed by uh, a focus discussion. So this is an hour and a half today. So Gabe will be presenting the first part of that and then we'll switch over to some discussion uh, rooms for the second part. Um, okay. For today's session, as I mentioned, um, Gabe Statistical Computing Consultancy is going to present on um, R tables um, and uh, generally a, uh, a framework around um, table creation uh, within uh, within R. I will hand over to Gabe uh, momentarily to kind of fully introduce that topic uh, and explain more about what he's going to talk about. Um, we'll follow this with some discussion rooms. Um, this is the first time we've uh, attempted to use the Hopin platform uh, for this, so uh, bear with us as we find out any technical difficulties that we might face. But we'll split into a couple of discussion rooms. Uh, Gabe is going to be talking about skills evolution. So today's, um, as mentioned, today's uh, theme is on uh, tables. And um, uh, one of the um, challenges when we're moving to an R-based reporting um, uh, tool set, and you'll see an, a, a very advanced tool set that Gabe is going to talk about and present, is uh, you need a different set of skills to build and maintain that um, that tool set. So Gabe's going to lead a session looking at like what that future might be, whether it's statistics and programming, data science, what are the kind of skills that we need um, to build and support these kinds of frameworks. Uh, and I'll be leading a session talking about multifaceted reporting. So with the theme on tables, where where do we go next? What what's the what are the next steps within industry? And I'll talk about concepts uh, briefly like analysis results data, uh, and then we'll have a discussion around that. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I will hand over to Gabe to properly uh, introduce himself uh, and his talk. And I will see some of you again for the discussion a bit later.
Hi, everyone. So thanks, uh, thanks, Andy, for the introduction and for sort of facilitating this uh, larger, larger series. Um, and like Andy said, today I'm going to be talking about reporting table generation with R and R tables, uh, both as a package itself and also as a sort of larger case study in the place for innovation within you know production focused uh, arenas such as generating the tables that are required for clinical trial submissions uh, so first just a little bit about me i'm the primary developer for uh for the modern version of what's now called r tables uh and i'm a statistical computing consultant uh, i have a phd from uc davis in statistical computing um, and i'm also a frequent collaborator with the r core team uh, and am you know responsible for helping put uh, multiple new features uh, into the r language um, can people hear me okay I'm not. Um, okay. Well. Okay. So I'm I'm hearing from some people that they can hear me okay. Um, so I'll just go ahead and keep going. Um, right. So I I have collaborated with the R core team on uh, numerous. Um, new features that have that have successfully been put into the into the R language. Uh, and I'm also, uh, as Andy mentioned, a member of the R tables for regulatory submission, or RTRS working group. Um, and it's sort of that hat that I that I have on uh, for for this particular meeting. Um, and so that that's an R consortium formal working group uh, with members that represent multiple pharma industries, multiple uh, a wide variety of table package authors. Um, at the U.S. FDA uh, as well as as well as R Studio, um, and there's an ongoing ongoing work in that working group uh, to sort of assess the full feature space of what tables, uh, what table features are, are required um, within the pharma industry, in particular for, for regulatory submission. And we're collectively authoring a state of the field literature review that discusses how the various tooling uh, can meet those needs uh, that's available in R right now. Um, and in terms of, of that literature review, we do have um, an open call for what we're calling difficult tables. So tables um, that existing tooling, um, you know, leave something to be desired when you're trying to create these tables uh, with R, with the, with the table packages that are in R. Um, and so if you have any um, any sort of table archetypes that, that you've found particularly challenging uh, generally, but or particularly when when you're trying to create them in R, um, we would love to hear from you. There's the uh, at the R Consortium GitHub organization. There's the RTRS WG, so the that working group's uh, repository. And uh, please do file an issue um, and describe the tables um, and the table features in particular that are that that have been challenging for you or, or your, your spas or, or whoever is actually doing it. And with that, uh, we'll move into the first, uh, the first sort of section of this talk. Like th this talk is going to essentially have three sections. The first is going to be what, where I describe our tables. Um, and then I'll, I'll pivot a little bit and discuss the why. So why was it valuable? um to invest quite a bit of effort into into developing our tables um and then uh finally i'll discuss the sort of how how we were successful what, what needed to be in place in the organization for for this to ultimately work so our tables is an r package uh that is purpose built for creating what are called reporting tables, so tables whose purpose is for the display of information rather than the storage of information. 
Um, it is general across table types. It is not specific to uh, regulatory submission tables, although it does cover the the use cases for regulatory submission tables, as we'll see. Uh, and it has a modern expressive API that that uses the pipe, which people who use R are, you know, pe people like the pipe. So it has a sort of pipeable modern expressive API. Um, and so why the just a little preview of why, um, and that is that tables are a cornerstone of the larger work that needs to happen to enable clinical trial work in R. So tables are not sufficient. If you can only make tables, you're not going to be able to do your clinical trial completely in R, but they are necessary in that you can't file a, a clinical trial without these reporting tables. And so if you're going to do that in R, you need a way in R to make those tables. And R tables is a is a foundational framework for doing that. And we'll see what that means in a second. Um, so just a little bit uh, quick by the numbers um, the, at Roche, which is which is who's um, funding and supporting this this work. Um, there are currently around 200 production table variant templates uh, that use uh, our tables in addition to things that are built on top of our tables uh, in order to be able to make the uh, make the tables that that your spas ultimately need to deliver to the the trial teams uh, and these are across a wide variety of different table types so you've got the standard ones that are going to be in every single um, clinical trial, as far as I know, right? You've got your adverse events tables, you've got your demographics tables, and your you know time to event tables and things like that, as well as some that are more specific but still um, general enough to to be standard tables, like you know the lab test result tables, the you know ECG related tables for things that they're doing with with that type of data and things like that. And so our tables has been very successful inside of Roche. Um, and so it is actively being used in multiple ongoing Roche trials. Uh, and in those trials, it will be used to generate the tables that are that are in the filing when, when filing happens for those trials. Um, in addition, starting uh, sometime in 2023, it is planned that all new Roche studies will be using R and R tables for, for, their, for their analytics work. Um, existing studies may um, continue to use the sort of legacy SAS-based systems, but any newly started trial after that date will be using um, things that are built on top of R tables. And also, even for even for um, trials that are have not switched over, that are still using this sort of legacy systems, uh, many of those still use things that are built on top of um, our tables for exploratory work, uh, which I'm not going to talk too much about. But but that is another major thing that you can do with these reporting tables, um, and that is in use even a, even in an even wider variety of ongoing uh, Roche trials. So uh, in terms of availability, R tables is completely open source with a commercially permissive license. So there's no major barrier um, license wise for using it for commercial work. Um, it is available on CRAN. It's also developed in public. Um, and so all the active development of this package actually happens on a public facing Git GitHub repository within underneath the the Roche uh, organization, so you can actually see the development happen. You can file issues um, as a as a sort of non Roche employee. This 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 is all happening in public. Uh, it is currently funded and copyright um, Roche, just because that's um, they're the ones who are, have actually contracted with me to to make this as of right now. So now we're gonna pivot just a little bit. We've talked about sort of what our tables is and why it was made. So now we're gonna go into some relatively um, robust examples of 
uh, our table of what our tables can do and and how it can actually be useful to the to the people on your teams that are making that are ultimately going to need to make these tables. Um, so our tables, as I sort of alluded to a little bit before, is a general framework. It is not specific to clinical trial tables. However, it is I'm back. Um, so our needs of these features that that are ultimately required for We're back now. Okay, we're back now. I apologize for that. I guess my my uh, my internet was cutting out for a second. Um, but just to start, restart on this slide here. Um, so our tables is a general framework, but it's completely in, its design is in, informed by the needs of pharma in generating these regulatory submission reporting tables. And so as we're going to see in the in the tables that I'm about to show you, um, it has a lot of these features um, that will ultimately be useful for that. So here is an adverse event table. Um, this should be relatively familiar um, to most people um, in, in that, that are that that are working in pharma in this audience. Um, and so we can see that there's a lot of things going on in this table. We've got a complex uh, structure and in both column space and row space. So in column space, we've got the we're broken up by arms and then we have an all patients um, section in addition to each arm. So those are, these are overlapping groups, which I'll talk about in a little bit later and then underneath there's further splitting and this is this is this is completely fake data but this is like a fake biomarker so you have a low low biomarker value and high biomarker value and then in the row space we have system body uh system organ class and then underneath that we have uh i believe it's called preferred term um in addition to having some overall um some overall summarization that is is at the top there so we're going to talk about how you can build this table, this, this you know, honestly, pretty complex table um, with R tables. And, and the way that R tables works is that you build up the structure of the table that you want and then tell it what to do inside of the cells that are defined by that structure. So we're going to start simple. Um, and so now we just have a tiny little table where the col there's a single column with all the observations in it, and we just have this really basic summary um, that we saw at the top of our larger table. And then once we have that, we can say, okay, now I want to split by column. So now I actually want columns for the for each of the arms that I have. And so all that we need to do that do to do that is split by split columns by arm and then it knows okay you have two columns and then everything else that you've told me is going to happen in each of those two columns so now that we now we see we have these patient counts and these event counts for each of these columns and we didn't have to do anything extra to do that and then we say we're going to change this and I'll talk a little bit about why in a second, we're going to change that analyze to a summarize. So now that that patient count and event count is this is a summary, uh, is a group summary, and we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. Um, and then we're going to analyze um, toxicity grade. 
Um, and so here we're counting, you know, any grade and then grades one and two. And I restricted to grades one and two just for for real estate reasons. Normally, I believe it goes up to five, but the two is enough to show what's going on. And next we say, okay, so we've got that, but I would like sort of row sections for each um, system organ class or, or, or body system. Um, and so now we've got nervous system disorders and vascular disorders. And underneath each of those, we have that same sort of analysis of toxicity. So again, when we're adding this, this splitting, we don't have to do anything extra to get um, to get these analyses to happen within each of those, with each of, which it, within each of those sections. And so that's that's really the core design. You can think about it in terms of facets, as as if you as if you're in in a sort of multifaceted plot. Uh, so you've got these facets, and then each in each of those facets, you have something that you want it to do, and then it will it takes care of all of the data munching and grouping and subsetting and all of that in order to do that um, automatically. Underneath these uh, I apologize for for my internet Next, um, next, we're going to further split underneath these um, system oriented classes to this preferred term. So you can see, uh, again, this is a subset of data. So the um, so we have under nervous system, I just have headache, and then I have two under vascular disorders. Now, normally these tables would be much bigger, obviously, um, and each system organ class would have a large number of, of things underneath it. But um, we're just doing this for, for time, or for, for space, I should say, for space. Um, so again, we just had to add this, this additional splitting, and nothing else changed. All of the code that's, that's sort of grayed out is identical to what it was on the previous slide. And so the only thing that we needed to do to get this, this sort of deeper hierarchical structure was just add this one little bit of splitting. Uh, and then we can summarize each of those. Um, and we're, so what we're doing is we're summarizing the larger groupings, the, the system organ class groupings. So now we have counts for the system organ class groupings in addition to sort of sub counts for each of these, for, for each of these, um, preferred terms, right? And now we say, OK, well, that's all great. But now we want a an additional column. So we're going to go back up. Um, and we're going to say, I would like this column, this sort of column splitting to include a split that is all the patients. Um, and so this is a special case of a much more general thing that that our table supports. So our table supports completely arbitrary overlapping groupings whenever you're doing a split. So a lot of times you'll see in 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 package um, in in our packages or table packages or table software, you'll see a sort of the all column or total column to be special cased. But um, here it's really just another overlapping group and our tables doesn't care what the overlap of the group is so if you if we had three arms to our study which we don't again for space we could say arm a arm b arm a and b and all at all we could have those four uh or and, and c and so we could have all of those groupings um and we could have groupings that overlap but were not the entire set um, and everything else would work exactly the, the how it is here. It's just that for convenience, there is this special cased function that just adds an, an overall all patients uh, column. Um, 
and so that again um all we're doing we're not even adding a new splitting we're we're controlling the behavior of the split by um, using a, what's called the split function which again is completely general it can define any arbitrary splitting of the data that's coming into it um and then of course uh in terms of actual regulatory filings it's crucial to have titles and footnotes um and so here we can have uh, titles and footnotes that made up the name of a study, um, which is completely not real. And then I, you can see I have a little um, thing on the bottom here that's um, essentially some provenance information. You can you can put whatever you want down there, but this is just an example, like you know, where the file the file where the data came from, the snapshot date of the data, and the user that that generated the the table. Um, and another thing that we have uh, is referential footnotes. So referential footnotes, you can see here in the headache, we have this little one there now. And then at the bottom, we, we have the note that I, I, I made up all of this, right? But we're saying that these are non-migraine headaches and then perhaps um, migraine um, is a different is a different preferred term. I don't know if that's true because I'm not, um, that's not my area of expertise, but it, it illustrates the point that you can have these referential footnotes. And you can actually have these referential footnotes anywhere. Um, you can have them on rows, you can have them on columns, and you can have them on individual cells. I only have this one example just for, for time and space, but you can put these referential footnotes in any one of those areas. And another thing while we're on this slide, um, the way that this is working, um, if you look a little closer at this code, you can see that we're, we're addressing into the existing table to tell it where the um, to, where, to tell it where we would like this footnote to go. And so we have a really robust um, sort of indexing system that's based on what we call pathing. And so you can actually, it's, it's, it's semantically meaningful, this, this area of the table, this row, this address of the row um, that, we're, that we're actually adding our, our footnote to, right? So you can actually read it and know exactly what's going on. So it's, the first step is going into um, body system and then which body system is it? It's nervous system. And then underneath nervous system, you go into the further split of preferred term. And then which preferred term is it? It's headache. And then that addresses that row. And then you get, um, you get that. So that's referential footnotes. Um, and then I, I'm adding this at the end just because it got too wide before, but to actually get the actual table that we saw in the beginning, we need to have this further split in column space where you where you have these these uh, biomarker low and high. And so that's again, you know, following this similar theme is just a um, an addition of another um, column split. And so we just add that there. Everything else stays identical. Um, and now we have this table here uh, at the bottom. And uh, it looks like I'm I'm on top of it a little bit, but you can see that the um, if you look carefully, you can see that the the uh, the footnotes still worked because the the footnotes address was in row space. So changing how the columns are structured didn't didn't change that at all. So that's how we get that table. Um, and then we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and do um, we're gonna go ahead and do the uh, a few other sort of core features that that our tables has that that perhaps differentiates it. Um, all right, sorry. So first, something that may not have been clear, but the the design of our tables is such that layout code which is what this is these are layouts and then at the very bottom you see the build table which actually applies a layout to data so all of these layouts are completely data agnostic they don't they don't have anything to do with, they don't have anything to do with actual data yet they just have to do with data structure in terms of the variables that are that are there and what you can see in this slide is that 
that layout code is actually naturally parameterized between table structure and business logic. And then the third thing, which is grayed out in both places, which is sort of visual um, fiddling to get it to look exactly how you want. But you can see the, the core business logic of what you want to show up in the cells is all completely on the right and is largely independent of what's on the left. And the left is simply what structure do you want that those computations to happen within? And that's the sort of, okay, what are your row splits? What are your column splits? Things like that. And so that ends up being really nice in terms of you can swap out business logic really easily without touching anything else. Um, and you can also see how if you are building something on top of our tables, then it would be easy to parameterize something that only touched the things on the right. So where you could swap out business logic, but you had a sort of core standard structure to your table that was always going to be the structure to your table. So that um, is a is a nice thing, I think, in terms of sort of allowing you to sort of think about different aspects of the table at different parts of the process of building the code. Um, so the next thing, um, so you can then operate on these table objects once they're created. So they don't dump straight to file. Um, and so here we have an example where we have a table. Um, and then if you look really carefully, I, I apologize, it's probably not the most clear, but if you look really carefully, you can see that here we have um, we have one uh, digit in, after the decimal um, in the percent, and here we actually have two. And this, all that we are doing is saying, okay, take the table that you already have now at this particular pass. So here we have the paths again, right? Here we have the paths that that semantically index in a meaningful way into these objects and saying, okay, go to this path and change the format. And you'll also note that I'm changing to the format to something with more precision, right? I'm not just truncating here. We're actually changing the format to something with more precision. So that means that the underlying table object actually has the full raw values. And it can it can very happily say, okay, you want you want a different format, you want a different way of actually rendering that when you are printing it or dumping it to file or what have you, that's totally fine. Um, and then again, we have a third way where we're actually getting less precision. So you can do both. Um, so that is another thing that you can do that that is only possible because we have this rich object model uh, that underlies what how our tables behaves. Um, another really important thing um, is, I was told um, is pagination. Um, now, pagination can sometimes seem like a simple problem for those of us who haven't done it before. But pagination of a, of a table like this is actually more complicated because there are certain contextual rows that you need to repeat. And so here we have we're paginating our table. Um, and I've chosen a table that's a little bit narrower just for space again. So we're not doing the we're not doing the biomarker splitting in the columns. But we're we're sorry, we said, okay, so paginate my table. I want 35 uh, maximum lines per page. That's what LPP stands for. And that paginates our table into two sections. And the important there, there's a couple of key notes here, right? So Looking to the second page, so the second page is the one on the right here, you can see that the title, in addition to these, the title, in addition to these summary rows, um, are repeated. So this sum, this total page overall summary is actually repeated on each page. I didn't, I didn't have to tell it to, to do that. It knows to do that because of what we did way back and I said we would we would uh, come back to when we changed that analysis to a to a group summary. So group summaries are contextual information. And so when you paginate within a group that has a summary, each part of the group gets 
that summary. The summary is repeated, and that all happens automatically. Uh, and so we see we have at the top, we have these um, these repeated things here. And because we're we so where the, the actual pagination ends up occurring with this particular lines per page is within vascular disorders between hypotension and orthostatic hypotension. Um, and so again, we can see that this contextual information, this the vascular disorders overall summary count is repeated automatically. Um, and so that um, that is that is a much sort of more robust um, and I'm told useful version of pagination than simply counting lines and truncating. Uh, another thing to note um, here is that you know while the titles and the footers are repeated for each page, the referential footnotes here, which are a little bit under me, are only on the page that are that they're relevant to, right? So the referential footnote was not repeated down here because the thing that it refers to is only in page one. It's a row that's only in page one. Um, if that were a summary row that were repeated, it would be repeated. Um, and so all of this stuff is going to happen automatically because our tables understands its table structure uh, in a way that you don't get when you have In a way, in a way, yeah. I really apologize, to everyone, for the for the connectivity issues. Um, but because our tables understands the table structure in a way that you can't um, that you can't do when you just have a pure sort. Of, um, they Automatic. You don't. You So I apologize again for that. Um, and so it's going to do all of this, all of these things automatically um, when when you paginate. Um, and next we have, have um, another nation. Um, and what's happening here is we're actually going to do a of a variable during the layouting. Pagination is simply a function of the count of, of rows, right? And then it's doing it's doing some fancy things to make sure that uh, contextual information is repeated. And so this is something different. We're saying, I want you to split the table by biomarker. We're going to split the um, we're going to we're going to split the pages right. So low biomarker here is a completely different page from high biomarker, and this is a slightly different table just again for space. Um, but we can see here we had to do sort of get these sort of different readout full page tables is paginate or is uh, is split by uh, split by this variable and then do page by equals true. Um, and so that ultimately allows us uh, to get what I, I've seen a lot in like lab uh, lab tables where you might you might have multiple lab uh, values that you're reading and you want essentially a table for each of them. And so you can split on a variable that says what type of 
lab readout it is, like what that what what thing you measured. Um, and then you get this nice pagination process and everything else is exactly the same. Um, so I think that is uh, pretty nice. Uh, so that is that is section the first section where I where I show you what our tables can do. Uh, so this is what we've been doing um, in, when we're building our tables. Now we're going to talk about why would we do that uh, in the first place. Um, and so now we need to step back a little bit from individual tables and talk about sort of the effort in generating these these types of tables in in the context of the work that that pharma companies are doing so there's this famous quote of course uh the rising tide lifts all boats um and that is true if you do it right and what i'm going to argue here is that our tables is the type of effort that rises the tide that does carry all the boats with it. And that's in fact, the primary reason um, that it, that it was ultimately a good investment um, from a, you know, from a management uh, point of view. So there are, there are multiple types of efforts when you're going to create a table like this, you've got the frontline work. So the actual construction and or instantiation of an individual table this is this is the sort of invaluable work that's done by spas that are that are working with individual clinical trial teams and need to generate the tables for those teams and then you have uh, what I'm going to call spa enabling development um, now internally these are called SMEs which are subject material experts um, and so I'll use that terminology sometimes uh, but just try to remember every time I say SME what I'm actually talking about is the spa enabling development and I'll talk a little bit more about exactly what that means uh, and then you have sort of core general tooling development and that is going to ultimately going to be our tables in this in this particular example so the spas are responsible for the ultimate creation of these tables. Um, they use templates and, and uh, other sort of tools and implementations of business logic that are provided to them by the, by the spa enabling developers, by the SMEs. Um, and they're also completely responsible for ad hoc tables um, that don't adhere to the standard templates that have been provided to them. Um, and in terms of a sort of delivery, mail delivery analogy, the spas are sort of the last mile delivery. They're, they're the ones that actually get the table to the door of the people who need it. Um, next, we have the SMEs or spa enabling tool developers. They develop these templates and reu reusable templates and reusable functions that implement the business logic that, that is contributes to multiple tables um and that these again these are first by definition for standard tables these are for tables that you know many spas might need to make for many different clinical trial teams um, and so you have this sort of um collection of effort uh into these reusable reusable templates and reusable tools um and then you have the sort of core table framework. Uh, and what this is ultimately going to do is provide building blocks and tools for that team, for the spa enabling development team to use to create those templates and to create those, um, those reusable pieces of business logic. Um, and it's, it's important here, and I'll mention this a, a few different times, um, but the, the core table framework is not targeted specifically at any particular table endpoint, uh, in either in terms of actual instantiation of tables or even in terms of the endpoint of any given table template. It is the tool that is intended to allow the creation of all of the table templates. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of three different scenarios that you might be in at different points in time in your organization. And so the first is that you have these sort of largely unsupported spas. So you've got this spas, the sort of people that are going to create these actual tables and hand them to, to clinical trial teams. Um, and they are doing a lot of the work for any individual table. And then you've got a sort of small 
amount of this business logic um, in, in terms of the SMEs, the spa enabling developers that ultimately feeds into that. But most of the work for any given tables is going to be for done by the spas. And then you don't really even have a general framework in that case. The general framework is, is just R and, you know, dplyr, um, which are very powerful, but they're not intended specifically for tables. Um, next, you might sort of upgrade to a robust spa enabling development effort where you don't, you still don't really have very much going on in the general research framework, but you do have a sort of much more, much more effort going into these standard templates and reusable templates and reusable pieces of business logic. And what that ultimately means is that, um, standing on those shoulders, essentially, um, the spa, the, the effort that's required by spas for, for any individual table is reduced because they have these templates and these reusable pieces that they're able to use. Now, the, the effort is never going to be zero, um, but they are going to be able to be much more efficient during the creation of any individual table using these. Um, and finally, you have this third situation, which is what I'm going to argue the the sort of R tables um, based efforts in Roche um, embody is where you actually have a, a robust general framework, which does the same thing for the spa enabling developers that the spa enabling developers are doing for the spas. And so what that does, that doesn't actually affect the spas too much yet, but we'll see in a moment that it will affect them quite a bit. But in this picture, it's not actually changing the picture for the spas, but what it's doing is it's changing the the picture for the for the SMEs so that the, they can more efficiently and more effectively generate these templates, generate these um, pieces of business logic. Now, as I said, that didn't seem to um, to affect the spas too much. Um, and the spas are where the sort of majority of the effort is um, in terms of, uh, you know, number of bodies, number of, of uh, amount of effort, person hours, all of that kind of thing. Um, but if you think back to a little bit of, of something that I mentioned earlier, spas are also responsible for ad hoc tables. And ad hoc tables do not get built on top of these standard templates because the standard templates are only for standard tables. So when you have ad hoc tables in the mix, we're going to run through each of these three things. And I'll try to go a little bit uh, quickly because I, I can see the time. Um, the spas have to do all of the work that work that is equivalent to the 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 work that was being done for them by the templates in addition to any work that they had to do on top of the templates. So you can see here that the effort that the spas are doing over here is starting way down here. It's starting where the where the sort of reusable template pieces are starting and they have to go all the way up. Now that's not really that surprising because this is, this is the unsupported spas case. But when you move to the sort of robust efforts, the story doesn't change any for ad hoc tables because the ad hoc tables don't use these templates and these reusable pieces that the, the SMEs, the spa enabling developers were, were creating because they're ad hoc tables. But when you have a general framework and that general framework can also be used for ad hoc tables, now suddenly the, the picture changes quite a bit. And now suddenly the, we do have something that the that the frontline spas are benefiting from in terms of these effort efforts like our tables, uh, these general framework um, developments, because it allows the construction of ad hoc tables for roughly the same amount of effort as it does these these table templates, because it is a it has this layouting engine that essentially allows you to create these tem these templates. And so that's really from the from the spa perspective, from the from the management perspective, that's that's where the really big 
uh, win comes in is is because there will always be ad hoc tables and you don't want ad hoc tables to be so painful and so divorced from the way that you make standard tables that sometimes spas can just be blocked and they just ha essentially have to wait for a new template to be created here if if they if they do learn the R tables framework they don't have to wait to do that you know they still ultimately for standard tables you want you want them to be supported you want them to have these templates but when those templates aren't there they do have a way forward that that actually is going to help them to get what they need so that's the that's the end of round second part round two um that's the that's the why why our the r tables framework was was a good investment not from a research perspective but from a from a sort of actually being able to generate tables perspective um and now i'm gonna somewhat briefly because i'm looking at the time talk about the how 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 we were successful in doing this um so there's this there's this famous quote that supposedly henry ford said but he didn't actually say or there's no evidence that he said it which is you know if i had asked people what they wanted they would have said they wanted faster horses because they had they didn't have the concept of cars so they didn't know that they wanted a car um and our tables is not faster horses our tables is not an incremental improvement in the way that you would make tables using R before R tables existed. Um, now, R tables, the features of R tables have been incrementally added, but what R tables represents is a paradigm shift in how you can make tables using R. Um, and it's also, you know, the result of novel statistical computing research or, you know, innovation, if you prefer that term, but it's a, it's a major transformative innovation um, in terms of how tables are are doing are being made and so how do you get that um, there there's essentially three pillars that you need in order to hold up this type of sort of specific within a production program type of research and innovation um, the first is you need support of, of management at both the high level and the sort of lower project level. Uh, you need buy-in from stakeholders, uh, which is crucially important. And then you need to actually, you know, do the research. You need to have um, you, you need to have the the capacity to do that. And so the management uh, that's a little bit annoying that it did that. But um, just to click through so it doesn't look weird. Um, management support in terms of the our tables project we had upper management support because the upper management essentially at roche in in pd uh supports the product owners and the tech leads and then trusts them within their within their uh projects to do the types of innovation um that are actually going to help them meet the goals of the project uh and then nest which is the sort of our infrastructure effort within pd um is uh the project within which the r tables work was happening you know at the time uh that was the tech lead was adrian waddell and the the project owner was tad lewandowski uh and adrian uh saw the importance of tables both as a need like something that he had to have a solution for in order to do clinical trial work with R um, and as an opportunity. Um, and then th they devoted Nest efforts to innovate in the table space, um, which resulted in essentially a narrow applied research program within the larger Nest product, which was R tables. Um, and so R tables is this, this sort of little cornerstone um piece of a much larger and much more powerful project which is nest which also incorporates a lot of um exploratory visualizations it also incorporates the the sort of spa enabling development efforts um and all of these things um but 
sort of tables were recognized as this place where innovate where that were ripe for innovation and where innovation would actually benefit the product as a whole. Um, and then now the that uh, the the Nest uh, leadership is being continued by by Pavel Ruki and Jaime uh, Perez. Uh, so uh next you have the stakeholders which is this sme team which is remember the spa enabling developers um and they were responsible for the template creation um and in 2020 which was sort of the first major full year of our tables and de development uh the, what's the the new version of our tables um they had a formal goal to go from zero tables that table templates that could go that could be made in R up to 200. Um, and they communicated with the R tables team what they needed, but they were flexible on how it worked, right? So this is the, I need to get to where I'm going faster, not I need my horse to run faster, right? This is, this is the core difference that we're talking about here. And so they really bought into that and, and they were willing to invest in learning how to do, how to use this tool, this completely different tool that we were developing that would ultimately, and I'm, I'm confident they would agree at this point, make their lives easier once they had learned how to use it. Uh, uh, and that also resulted in truly invaluable feedback on the design and the API and what capabilities were required. Um, and so that that feedback is really, really key. We were meeting with the, and still are meeting with the SME team every single week um, to talk about sort of what features they needed, what was working well in terms of the development versions that they have access to, that everyone has access to, because again, it's public, uh, et cetera. Uh, and finally, there's the there's the actual R tables team, which was doing the research. Um, and again, the R tables team is not responsible for creating any table right any individual table is not is not the job of the r tables developers which frees us to think about what tables are as a whole and how to sort of and which is what allowed us to get to this um this sort of layouting um engine um and we the flip side of what i said about the smes we asked the, the smes what they needed to be able to do not how what their thoughts were on on exactly how the internal should work um and then we had direct frequent collaboration with the sme team for a tight feedback loop um and so if you knock down any one of these pillars if any one of those three pillars wasn't there then what i showed you in the first part of this talk would not um would not ultimately have resulted um and so just in the final couple minutes uh the next steps for our tables uh so we are collaborating with our studio on a package uh called tgen which essentially is going to take an our tables object um and be able to render to many different output formats um you know including rtf html so our tables already does have ASCII and HTML, it does not have RTF, but so it'll have RTF, it'll have HTML, et cetera. Uh, it also has, it will have a lot of visual formatting of tables, including like, you know, coloring of cells and bolding of text and things, which which our tables currently doesn't model. Um, and then there are also going to be sort of, there's our tables is continuing to be developed. Um, and so, uh one of the major thing we have a, a a large roadmap but one of the major things is you know qc targeted features for comparison of tables you know quality checking ensuring the tables are correct um it, and things like that um and yeah so that uh with you know 50 seconds left on the on the hour uh that is the that's what I had for you. Again, I apologize for the connectivity issues that were going on um, during the during the process. But um, yeah, that's that's what I had. So I think um, are we doing? 
sort of general Q and A and then breakout, or is it straight to breakouts? Uh, no, we do we'll do general Q and A um, very very briefly, but try and yeah, sure. I'll try and limit it so we can get to the the breakouts. So. Um, just looking at what's come in, not a huge amount's come in. Uh, Gabe, actually, I don't know if you can see the, the Q&A directly just to, to see these questions. I in case I, um... can. I wasn't looking at it while I was trying to go. But, <laughs> yeah, um, no, no worries. Yeah. So, um, so we've got a question from Andy Nunes. Uh, Adrian Waddle mentioned flexible table coercion in the chat. Can you say more about using uh, flex table? Yeah, table? so um, so we do have as sort of a, a currently working precursor to what will ultimately be rolled into to TGen functionality. Um, we do we do have um, we do have support for exporting to Flex Table, which then gets you to all the formats that Flex Table can output to. Um, so we do have we we do have that that is supported that is in. Um, right now, and so I know that you can you can sort of do some of this formatting once you once you've converted to Flex Table, you can sort of color cells and do other things that that Flex Table supports. Um, you don't you no longer have a lot of the things that 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 I showed you in terms of pathing and changing formats and things because that's it's a rendering essentially. You're rendering to a Flex Table, and so it's 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 post rendering. So you don't you don't have that, but you do have the like. I want to further alter the rendering by coloring and, and things like that. And that also does get you, you know, into PowerPoint slides via Officer, um, which which integrates with FlexTable. Um, I, I want to say they also support RTF, but I can't completely swear to that. Um, but there, there's a number of things that you can do. Um, and we also do have um, PDF. Um, essentially, we can export PDF versions of the ASCII tables with pagination and things like that. So, so we we have a number of different things that we have, and again, that's going to be subsumed into a much larger, more feature-rich package, which is TGen, which we're we're actively collaborating with our studio on. Brilliant. Well, th thank you, Gabe. There are, there's um, the Roche team have done a great job during the session of answering a few sort of quick questions via comments. So. Uh, there were a lot of questions, but they they have been answered. So thanks, guys, um, for putting those in. What we're going to do now? Um, well, actually, first of all, thank you, Kate, for the pre the presentation yeah. uh, as well. And um, what we're going to do now is uh, switch to the discussion room. So hopefully, everyone's got the time they can there, and you've got you've got another 20, 25 minutes or so. Um, as I mentioned at the start, um, got the titles of the session slightly wrong, but Gabe's the, Gabe will run one, and I will run uh, the other. I think there should be a banner or something appearing some point soon for you to click on if not you can go to sessions and then you'll see the two sessions um and um uh and you can join from there so we'll end this main stage piece now um but if you head to over to sessions you can click on that and uh join whichever room you want to join so um we'll see you all uh in in a couple of minutes yeah right. thanks everyone